but breeding livestock used to be dead easy. You know, you'd measure a few simple traits um, and uh, select for them. Uh, now it's a lot more complicated and a bit more expensive because you're trying to be more balanced. You know, we, we learned some lessons that if you select too much on some traits, you can cause damage in others. Uh, so now uh, animal breeding is a lot more balanced. The only problem is with some of those traits, they're only measurable late in life. They're only measurable on the dead product. Um, they're only measurable in one sex. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a way of reading the book of life and actually predicting what their genetic merit was without having to measure it? And that's where the DNA diagnostics comes in as being hugely valuable in being able to do that. Lots of things going on in animal breeding at the moment. One that fascinates me is in, is in the pig industry and, and less so in the poultry industry, but that's taking account of gr group or social effects. It's selecting for animals that are good performers in a group. They're good team players. Um, and that's starting to have some impact in, in pig breeding selection. And then many more DNA tools that allow you to all, do all sorts of things, to aid selection, to manage crossbreeding. Uh, if you have a composite, but I had this conversation with um, uh, a Canadian breeder the other week, uh, we've, we've got a composite population and we, we started it with these five or six breeds and we've run it for 20 years and we think we now ought to introduce something. What, what should we introduce? Well, first of all, find out what you kept because there's no point putting back into the top of that population stuff that you've thrown out from the original breeds. You know, find out what was good and add some more of that, not some of the stuff that you've already thrown away in the process of selecting your composite population. Detect and eliminate inherited diseases, measure and manage diversity, uh, predict genetic merit at a young age. Wouldn't that be nice? I'll skip that because I'm short of time. Not only is it nice, it's doable, it's happening. Right. Uh, and it's called genomic selection. Uh, the technology, the idea, was uh, invented by Theo Moeson back in 2001 when it was science fiction because nobody could contemplate being able to afford tens of thousands of genetic markers and now it's a couple of hundred dollars and getting cheaper. So the idea of genomic selection is you don't understand the biology in this, right? It's just tracking bits of DNA. We don't know what's happening in the same way as any breeder selecting doesn't know what's happening to the biology. But you associate the variation in these bits of DNA with measured traits on thousands of animals, and you say this bit of DNA is worth minus 0.1 of a gram daily life weight gain. And this bit of DNA over here is worth plus 2 grams per day daily life weight gain and you work out the association and you add them all up and then you get you get some prediction equations and then you apply it to animals that have no performance data you apply it to an animal that maybe hasn't been born yet you apply it to the embryo in the petri dish and you apply those thousands of genetic markers your prediction equations and you get a really good prediction of genetic merit it's not as good as keeping that bull till he's five years old and having a uh, hundred daughters milked, but actually it's really close. So that's transformed dairy selection. Key figure there, reduced sire son interval from five and a half to 1.8 years. A little bit less accurate, but boy, are we running faster. It's also now being applied in pigs and poultry. Um, it's more challenging in beef cattle and sheep. Uh, it's more challenging for a number of reasons, one of which is just the straight economics, and another is having sufficient performance recorded males. Uh, the accuracy has continued improving in Holstein and uh, way beyond 10,000 bulls in, in the prediction equations. When they got to sort of 12 and 14,000, then the accuracy seemed to be starting to flatten off. Lots of other things. Uh, I have about five minutes left from when I said I'd, I'd finish for the chairman, so I better rattle through. Lots of other things happening. I'm going to say more about breed GM. Um, new vaccines, therapeutics, and immune modifiers are all coming from understanding the biology of the pathogen and the biology of all the other bugs that are there, because uh, most of them are harmless. Uh, DNA tools for traceability, parentage assignment, authenticity. You've already seen that sort of thing. You know, DNA markers that will tell you whether this piece of beefsteak is 50% Angus or not. 
Um, and every time people look for genetic variation in um, disease resistance, they find it. One of the most recent examples of that was TB in dairy cattle. Uh, and what happened was that the DEFRA surveillance data was joined up to the BCMS data that was joined up to the pedigree uh, data from uh, Holstein UK and wherever, uh, which was joined up to the performance recording data, uh, and it's now possible to calculate estimated breeding values for, for TB susceptibility in, in dairy cows. It's not a solution not on its own. It's not a magic bullet. Um, it is part of something we can do uh, about TB. There is useful genetic variation in the resistance of bulls' daughters to TB. Uh, reproductive technologies and GM. Uh, obvious limitations that, that there's not that much use of AI in, in beef, cattle and sheep, uh, but there already is sex semen available in beef. Um, there's technologies being researched to, to make that available in, in other species, particularly in, in pigs. And imagine the impact of that, yeah, being able to control uh, the sex ratio. Am I running out of time? Okay. Um, I won't spend long on cloning because I am running out of time, um, but the most famous sheep in the world, top right. Um, and a very, very interesting bull in the middle. Uh, bull 86 squared is an Angus at Texas A&M College Station down in Texas. Um, he was uh, resurrected um, 15 years after uh, the original bull had died. Um, sorry, 15 years after the cells had been frozen. Bull 86 had progeny that were unusually, remarkably uh, resistant to brucella. Uh, and the last I checked, we still haven't quite worked out why, but we can continue doing that research because we've still got Bull 86 as a clone. And the cells have been frozen for 15 years. But I've got to introduce you to Elvis. Uh, um, Elvis was produced by one of the cloning companies um, in 2005 from a yield grade 1A steer carcass. Right? So being castrated and dead is no longer a barrier to leaving your genes behind. Right? Now, cloning doesn't have much application in breed improvement, but you go into a big abattoir and pick out the best carcasses. Think of the selection differential that you could achieve. Think of the one-year leap that you could achieve in carcass traits, by be well, especially if, as is the case in the States, you don't really care about the label on the books, right? You don't really care what the breed label is, uh, as only evidenced by the fact that to sell it as Angus, it only has to be black. Um, genetic modification, uh, en enhancing diversity through GM, um, and I deliberately say enhancing diversity through GM. The Aqua Bounty Salmon is uh, nearly, uh, nearly there. The FDA has no good reason to reject it, um, but it's been held up in politics. Um, it, it keeps growing through the winter, so it's much more feed efficient. Uh, there were pigs at the University of Guelph. I think these are in the freezer now, but uh, uh, they produce an enzyme in their saliva that you can also add to the feed, so there was no great justification for doing it via GM that enabled them to get the phosphate out of the cereals in their diet so they didn't have to have supplementary phosphate, so they pr polluted a lot less, d didn't get to the market. Um, uh, these are Bob Wall, well that's not Bob Wall's cow but to illustrate Bob Wall's cow uh, Bob Wall uh, at Beltsville produced some cows that were um, practically completely resistant to one of the mastitis pathogens uh, you could teach dip them with the pathogen and they just wouldn't get it uh, there's a project going on at the moment um, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in, in the US but with Roslyn and Anilri in Kenya um, a, a very clever biologist has worked out precisely why baboons never get sleeping sickness, why the pathogen can't infect baboons. Uh, and a very similar change is currently being engineered into cattle as a research project. Now imagine the impact of that on beef supply in Africa if trypanosomiasis was no longer a problem. Uh, and then, of course, there's, the, uh, there's Helen's um, chickens. These are GM for 
green fluorescent protein, so you can see it on the, uh, on the photograph. Um, but Helen's chickens were engineered to be resistant to avian influenza. The first experiment sort of worked. Uh, the birds themselves die, but they don't produce enough virus to infect their pen mates. So the infection just dies out, it doesn't spread. Now, if you have seen the way that um, bird uh, avian influenza is controlled around the world, when there is an outbreak and there is stamping out, and there's not an awful lot of care, right? So very poor welfare, even live birds thrown onto pyres. Um, so there's a welfare advantage for being avian influenza resistant, but there's a bigger advantage even for us, which is it reduces the risk of a global flu pandemic. So why wouldn't you do that? Um, I'll very quickly cover, and now we've got incredibly subtle genome editing tools. Uh, you can make very precise changes uh, in down to changing a single letter of the DNA code and leaving no trace that you ever did it through GM. Uh, and I put the horned animal there for the reason that German researchers just this summer finally identified the very precise mutation for POLD. Right, so you know POLD in the Holstein is at a very, very low frequency. So you could actually, over a long, long time, select for polled or you could cross Holsteins with something that was polled and introgressed in but you'd end up with something worse uh, and it would cost you a lot to do that. There's a research project going on as we speak uh, to make this change in very high merit Holstein bulls that already exist. So you'd be able to buy semen in the future from the clone of this bull that will give you polled progeny. Existing bulls. Um, and actually, even Farm Animal Welfare Council think that animal welfare applications of GM technology is a good thing. Uh, I'll skip that one because I'm out of time. Um, if you think of it as a biological revolution, uh, and I do, um, Graham Bullfield, who used to be the director of the uh, Rosalind Institute some years ago, was on a platform, and somebody asked him a question, and he said, it's like this, folks you're now at the start of the biological revolution. It's a lot like the industrial revolution. It just happens faster and has far greater impact on all our lives. So if it's a revolution, where are we? Well, we're somewhere between James Watt's steam engine and Stevenson's rocket. Right? That's our level of sophistication at the moment, so you ain't seen nothing yet. I will rattle through those. Um, you can read them as they are. Um, regulation's a big deal in Europe, obviously. Um, the number of GM livestock experiments going on at the Chinese Agricultural University um, is several times the number going on in the UK. Uh, probably ten times the number of experiments in one university in China. Uh, if you want to know more about what we do, if you Google underscore connect, you can sign up to the network. Um, and I'll thank you and thank all of our sponsors. Thanks very much.